Good morning. If you would, take your Bibles out and open them up with me to the first book of the Bible, the book of beginnings, Genesis. We are in Genesis chapter 4. We have gone through the creative order. God spoke and God fashioned and the world is in place. God has taken the sky, the sea, and the land, and he's filled it with good things. He created man from the dust of the ground, and he formed him, and he breathed into him, and he became a living soul, uh, meaning he had real live choices. He also created woman out of the rib of man and made them a one flesh unit in marriage with the purpose of being fruitful and multiplying, spreading out on the earth and making God's name great. It doesn't take long before Satan comes in. Uh, God has given Adam one command. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He gave this command to Adam even before Eve was even created. And the, the clear assumed uh, course of action was that Adam would take the command in leadership under God's authority and teach his wife. So it's not going to take long before Satan tempts and sees, hey, <clears throat> are they doing what God wants them to do? Or do I have a place where I can get a foothold, where I can get in the middle of it? And what do we find? We find that he goes to the woman and he finds out that she's leaving things out of what God said and adding things to what God said and ultimately they sin and rebel against God and they fall. Eve was deceived. Adam did it knowingly. And then God comes and he lays out the consequences of sin. He gives them hope in chapter 3 verse 15 that the woman... Uh, will have offsprings, and eventually the offspring will crush the seed of Satan. Um, but what we do see is there's the seed of the woman and the seed of Satan. There is this two paths, and we're going to see that continue on. We're going to see that in the most joyful situations, in the most uh, Joyful things that life offers for men and for women. Now they're going to still have these situations, but they're going to bring, instead of joy and satisfaction, it's going to bring pain and conflict. For a woman, childbirth and the relationship with her husband is going to be conflict and pain. For man, his job, his uh, working with the ground to provide for his family is going to work against him and provide pain and conflict. And so we finish chapter 3 with hope. God places them out of the garden so that they will not eat from the tree of life. But there is hope. He has clothed them, the first death mentioned. He has clothed them in the skin of an animal. First sacrifices have been made. Um, the Bible does not tell us much about that. Um, it's going to develop. Um, what we have, we have. And what we don't have, we won't speculate on uh, to very much degree. We come to chapter 4. And we're going to see that sin is never static meaning it never stays in the same place. It's always pervasive. And the sin of Adam and Eve has been dealt with. But yet now, when they have children, their children are going to be born already separated from God, already with a bend toward iniquity, to sin, not having a relationship with God. And so trying to struggle with what that looks like. And we're going to see, you, you know the old, uh, the old quote, and I do not know who initially uh, formed this quote, but that sin always takes you further than you want to go, uh, makes you stay longer than you want to stay, and costs you more than you want to pay. 
which is all true. Sin has consequences. There is forgiveness. Yet every time I sin, I, I reinforce a pattern of sin. And every time I reinforce that pattern of sin, it gets harder and harder to break the pattern. And we're going to see that played out uh, really in the rest of the Bible. But we're going to see it really played out in chapter 4 as we see uh, two different courses of life. And so, if you haven't already read chapter 4, let's stop right now, um, and let's, let's read it. And uh, then we'll pray, and then we'll dive into the Word. Father God, we love you. We thank you for who you are. In this world that is changing all the time, you remain constant. Constantly good. And Father, Satan is always trying to impugn your character. And Father, there have been times in my life where I have bought into it. And you have forgiven me and I thank you. Father, help us in this. Father, in times when I thought that I could be happy disobeying you, Father, that has been proven to be false. Happiness comes from knowing you. True life does not come, Father, by converting oxygen into carbon dioxide, but by knowing you. And I'm becoming more and more aware of that every day, Father, and for that I am eternally thankful. Father, help us, me and my brothers and sisters who are listening, that we might grow in this endeavor today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in chapter 1, verse 28, God told Adam and Eve to be fruitful and multiply and spread out. And here, initially, you've read it, chapter 4, they are obeying that. They um, have children. Now, I want to bring up a verse right from the get-go uh, that will kind of shed some light. This is a New Testament verse. Um, it's back in 1 John, all the way back, almost to the end. If you get to the book of the Revelation, you've gone too far. So you got Jude, then you've got 3 John, 2 John. Go to 1 John, chapter 3, and verse 10. We're going to keep going back to 1 John um, today and look at a few things, probably maybe more tomorrow than today. Um, but this one verse really defines, you know, this whole book of 1 John was written for people who believe and are having doubts so that they can be assured, they can know that they have eternal life. And in chapter 3 of 1 John, verse 10, it says, By this, the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Just take that for a second. The two kingdoms and its offspring are unmistakably different. I mean, polar opposites. And he describes the children of God, and by doing that, the opposite is going to be the children of the devil. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God. What is practicing righteousness? Deep God showing us our sin, and we uh, confessing that he is right, and we are wrong, and then repenting of it. That's practicing righteousness. Sometimes we call it walking with God. Sometimes we call it abiding with God. It is loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, uh, strength, and mind. Jesus Christ was righteous and is righteous. So he never sinned, so there was nothing to confess. We, on the other hand, are sinners. We were born sinners, starting with Cain that we're going to read about today. So we as long as we're in this sinful body, are not going to be 
practically righteous, meaning we're, not, we're going to still sin. My position is that I'm in Christ and I'm righteous. Old Testament, they were in Christ looking forward. We're in Christ looking back if I have surrendered my life to the Lord. We're going to see that with Abel. Abel is in Christ looking forward. Cain is not. We see, we, we do not see Abel being confronted with sin. However, we know that he was. Everyone is. We do see Cain being confronted with sin, and he rejects correction. This is a big difference. Remember, all the things that we use to know that we're saved, the Bible takes it down to two. Practicing righteousness and loving our brother. Both of which Cain proves that he has no interest in. Now, everyone is born a child of the devil, and only by having a reconciled relationship with God can that change. Adam and Eve were created with a relationship with God that they lost because of their rebellion and their sin. However, chapter 4 begins a change. Cain and Abel were born already separated from God, under the headship of Adam. When Adam sinned, everyone that comes from Adam is going to already be uh, in sin. The Old Testament uses the words iniquity and transgression, very important words. Iniquity is talking about what Cain and Abel and every other human being except for the Lord Jesus Christ was born with. Iniquity. A sinful nature, a bend toward sin, already separated from God. Now, what flows from that disease is the symptoms of the disease, which is sinful actions, what the Bible calls transgressions or rebellion. And so, what we see is we see Abel submitting to God, and we see Cain uh, Rebelling or continuing to rebel against God. Uh, it says now, verse 1, Adam had relations with his wife Eve, and he, she conceived and gave birth to Cain. And she said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. And the expectation, uh, I mean, being the first birth and having God already warn you to say, hey, this thing is going, this, this, situation of life is going to bring you so much joy, but it's going to be a painful process. And so think about Eve not having any doctors around, no, uh, no experience of anybody. I mean, in any woman that's having a baby, it's always helpful to sit down and talk with a doctor or someone else who has gone through it. Eve, none of that. So you can Understand that getting through that process and having the joy of holding a child um, and the expectation of maybe this is the one, maybe this is the seed, this is the seed that's going to save us. This is God's promise. She was hopeful. He was not, by the way. Again, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. And Abel was a keeper of flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So remember back in chapter 2, verses 8, uh, that the Lord had, a, had caused things to grow and wanted man to cultivate what God had caused to grow. And so his sons are being a part of that. And they, they both had their own lanes that they really took an interest in. Uh, Cain took an interest in planting. Uh, and Abel took more of a focus of animals and raising uh, you know, cattle and sheep. And we could call him maybe a shepherd or a herdsman. It says in verse 3, so it came about. In the course of time, okay, so a lot is, is not said there. Um, people assume that Adam and Eve 
were when God sacrificed the animals to clothe them, that they continually did this, and maybe they did, and, and maybe they taught their sons, I don't know. But all we can say is, is what we have. And all growing up, I was taught that, you know, Cain uh, hated God, and, and he was a bad kid, and Abel was a good kid. It's not true. Both of them were born sinners. Both of them, and I want to just come at it clearly in chapter 4, they're both trying to find out what it looks like to have a relationship with God. It was much easier for their parents because they had a relationship with God and knew what it was like to lose it and then desperately wanting it back. But for Cain and Abel and for every one of us who are born without a relationship with God, it's hard to miss something you've never had. So in this journey... To figure out what this is, they're both in it, and I think it's good. I don't see anything in the first uh, four verses that say that, you know, Abel was, you know, r w w loved God and that Cain didn't. Um, it says in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord. The covenant name of God is used here. Okay, so the Lord... He's trying to figure out how to have a relationship with God. Remember Elohim, the transcendent God, and he's described that way. And But Yahweh, all capital Lord, is this imminent. How do I have a relationship with this God? His parents did. How does he now? Every child has to have this decision. Uh, so Cain brought an offering to the Lord of the fruit of the ground, which seems normal and natural. What did he have? He took what he had and he brought it. I don't see any problem with that. Abel, on his part, also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions. What he had. Don't see any problem with it. They're trying to figure this thing out. They come before God. They offer what they have. That's what we know from the text. And it doesn't appear that the Lord is upset with the actions that are done. It says the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. He looked at Abel's offerings. I accept this. Why? It was a picture of Jesus Christ who was to come. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. So Abel was just bringing what he had, and he brought it, and God accepted it. Cain just brought what he had, and God didn't accept it. So all he would have had to say was, okay, God, you didn't accept this. What do you want? I'm trying to figure this out. I'm trying to please you, God. You show me, and I will submit to you. That would have been a very good thing, but that's not what happened. It says, so Cain became very angry, and his countenance fell. Now, we do know from Hebrews chapter 11, I'll read this to you, in the hall of faith that we call this, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4, says this, By faith Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained the testimony that he was righteous, God testifying about his gifts, and through faith, though he is dead, he still speaks. So it says in a better sacrifice than Cain. Why? Because it, every sacrifice from the Old Testament had to be offered in faith, okay, but in faith in God. And Abel's faith in God pointed to the one who was going to crush Satan's head. And so, therefore, it was accepted. Uh, Cain's offer of faith, of 
fruits and vegetables, even though later on fruits and vegetables were offered, but not as a sin offering, not as a burnt offering. Okay, so that God said, I'm not accepting that. It doesn't give a picture of the one that's coming, so I'm not accepting that. So Cain becomes very angry and his countenance fell because he wants God to accept what he wants to give. That's not the way God works. God wants me to submit to him. Now, he knows that I'm born with a bend away from that. So therefore, I have to come to the place of saying, God, you're right. And it takes some pain. For every one of us. Some, it takes more pain than others. Some, like Cain, never submit. God's not upset. We never see God angry. We see Cain angry. Then it says, the Lord said to Cain. And it keeps using the word Lord. So the Lord is trying to show Cain how to have a relationship with him. He says, why are you angry? And, and why has your countenance fell? He says, if you do well, your countenance will be lifted up. All you got to do is what I tell you to do. How hard is that? If your parents had done it, you wouldn't be in this predicament. All you got to do is what I tell you to do. And if you do something wrong, I'm going to show you that it's wrong. And then all you have to do is ask me what's right and I'll tell you. He says, if you do not do well, if you keep in this pattern, it's a sin is crouching at the door. So if you can imagine a 600 pound lion waiting behind the door and the 600 pound lion cannot get in the door unless you open it. And God's telling Cain, you're opening the door. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8. We read it yesterday. Be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. God is telling Cain, Satan wants to devour you. It's interesting that Satan is at work. We see him first at work in chapter 3, but he's never really mentioned after chapter 3 in all of the book of Genesis. But we're going to see him at work. If you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door, Cain, and its desire is for you. The last time God used this word desire is talking about the sin that's going to come about in the relationship between the husband and the wife as a result of their sin. From chapter 3, uh, verse 16, where he's talking to the woman and he says, Look, you've always been the helpmate to your husband, but now you're not going to want that. Your desire is going to be to rule him. He's always wanted to lovingly serve and lead you, but now he's going to want to dominate you. So you're going to want to dominate him, and he's going to want to dominate you, and that's not God's way. Sinful desire. Same thing over here. Satan wants you to give in to sinful desire. Why? Because he wants you. And what does he want you for? To destroy you. Remember, John 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning. A liar and a murderer. And God is trying to help Cain and you and me understand that our whole job here on earth is to, what he says, you must master it. So I'm born, you're born, Cain was born with a bend towards sin. And our whole job is not to amass stuff not to make our name great, but how do I master sin? And God is telling him initially, the more you get angry, 
That's not the way to help you master it. What is the way to master it is to come in humble submission, in total surrender to God and saying, I can't master this on my own. I need you, God. He says, if you believe that, bring a blood sacrifice that points to the one I'm going to send. But all we have is this. But don't make any mistake about it. The same thing that God is telling Cain is the same for you and me. How am I going to master this problem of sin? How am I going to master the problem of the sin I do? Well, if I really get down to it, the sin I do just reveals who I am. So how do I change who I am? I don't need reformation. I need regeneration. I don't need to try harder. I need to be born again. Leaves it there. God does not appear in any way, shape, or form upset. He is trying to show the truth to Cain. Then Cain told Abel his brother. That's the sentence. He came and told Abel what happened. We could assume that we know what Abel said. We do not. They had a conversation and whatever was the extent of that conversation, it made Cain hate Abel. I mean hate. We know from Matthew chapter 5 that a heart of hate leads to outside murder. He hates whatever Abel said he makes him hate him. And it came about when they were in the field that Cain rose up against his brother and killed him. God wants a blood sacrifice. This is what I'm thinking in my own mind. God wants a blood sacrifice. I'll give him one. I'll offer Abel. And he knew that that wasn't the sacrifice God wanted. Even though Cain, even though Abel is dead right now, what we read in Hebrews chapter 4, 11 chapter 4, is that chapter 11, verse 4, is that he still speaks. He still speaks. He still speaks as 2 Corinthians 5, 20 speaks. He was an ambassador for God. He spoke the truth to Cain. Cain hated the truth that he heard, and he killed his brother. That has not been the last time that has happened. Abel was not a perfect witness to the truth. But Jesus Christ comes later and was a, and is a perfect witness to the truth, but with the same results. Anger, persecution, and death. Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. So we've gone from the sin of eating uh, some forbidden fruit. It's not an apple, by the way. Apples come from an apple tree. What comes from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? The fruit of the top knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so let's clear that up. Don't give the apple a bad name. The apple wasn't the problem. It was the pear on the ground. Anyway. We've gone from eating forbidden fruit to now murdering our sibling. Come a long way. Do you think when Eve was sitting there contemplating how pretty the fruit was, how hungry she was, and how this could make her, give her the ability to teach Adam something, rather than her always being the learner, you think she saw this? The answer is no. She had no idea. But none of us do. God does. That's why he says, I'll tell you, and you just obey and submit to me. But that seems to be very problematic for us. There's been enough done for God to totally reject Cain. Does God love murderers? The answer is yes. Is there hope for murderers?
answers? And the answer is yes, but not if they refuse to deal with sin. I've heard this saying, and I get into trouble every time that I try to confront it, but I'm going to confront it again. There's this saying around uh, church people, God, the saying goes like this, God hates sin, but loves the sinner. Um, if that is the complete statement, it's wrong. That's not enough. You can read several places in the Old Testament. One that's coming to my mind is Psalm chapter 5. It says, not only does God hate sin, but he hates the sinner who won't repent. God hates sin, and he loves sinners who repent. But sinners who won't repent, separated from him in a place called hell for eternity. God hates sin. But he's given Cain, Abel, Adam, Eve, you, me, an opportunity to deal with sin. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel your brother? Again, God is asking a question not because he needs information. He is omniscient. He's asking, again, he's asking a question to give Cain the opportunity to come into the light. An opportunity to practice righteousness to confess his sin and to repent of his sin. Cain comes back. I do not know. Lie, number one. But then he gets kind of smirky with it and says, am I my brother's keeper? Isn't that your job, God? God comes back, asks another question. What have you done? It's seemingly a rhetorical question because he does not wait for an answer. The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. God knows what Cain has done. God knows what I have done. The only reason that Cain will not confess his sin, the only reason why I will not confess my sin, is because I'm trying to make myself look better than what I am. Jesus describes this as the prison that every one of us are born into. Being sinners, but trying to put forth the image that we are not. It always strikes me in this verse. If one man's murder cries out to God, what does it sound like today when 50 people were murdered just in the city of Chicago last week? When thousands and tens of thousands of babies have been murdered this year? What does that sound like in the ears of God? Verse 11, now you are cursed from the ground. We talked about this yesterday, that God never cursed Adam and Eve. He cursed the serpent, and he cursed the ground. Now we see God actually cursing a person in connection with the ground that is already cursed. So remember, the curse was of the ground was that the ground was going to produce things they're going to try to stifle the ability to grow. But apparently Cain had mastered that fairly well and was a very productive farmer. God says, no longer are you going to be able to grow anything from the ground. Now 
Think about that. You couldn't just go to Walmart and buy groceries. He was going to have to live off of and provide for himself and his family by just wandering and finding stuff that naturally grew. He could plant, but it wouldn't produce for him. Now let's think through this. Why did God do this? Think back. He wanted to bring to God what he wanted to bring to God. So he's wanting to bring to God what he feels like is bringing him significance. And obviously what brings him significance isn't God and submission to God. It's what he does for a living. Like many men, like most men, like all of us naturally, draw our satisfaction and even the definition of who we are by what we do. Cain was defined by his work. And God says, this work is an idol to you. It's caused you to turn from me and to murder your brother. So I'm taking away the idol. In hopes that you will humble yourself and come to me. That's the hope. We still see God being reconciliatory toward Cain. Now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you cultivate the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. You will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth. You've got to go find food that's already growing. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is too great to bear. You have driven me this day from the face of the ground. What always happens when God takes away an idol, we have a fork in the road. God has taken away this thing that I love so much, and I can either hate God because he took it, or I can seek to know God and try to understand why he took it. Cain chooses the former. He does much like his father. He starts to blame. And he blames God. The one person that truly, truthfully cannot be blamed for sin. It says, Behold, you have driven me this day from the face of the ground, and from your face I will be hidden. True, God and Cain have been separated. They're, this face is hidden is a term that meaning they're not having fellowship with each other. That was the whole point of this thing. What do I got to do to have fellowship with God? When Cain puts forward what he thinks it's going to take for him to have fellowship with God, God rejects it. And Cain is unwilling to submit to God's way of being reconciled. There is no hope for Cain. He says, I will be a vagrant and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will want to kill me. Remember, everyone he meets on earth is a relative. And a relative who may want to take vengeance on him for killing Abel. Apparently Abel was the well-liked brother. So then, a surprising thing happens in verse 15. The Lord said to him, Whoever kills Cain, vengeance will be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord appointed a sign. We don't know what that sign was for Cain. He was the first one that, here's your sign. Cain had a sign, something on him. When people saw him, they knew who he was, and they knew they'd better not mess with him. They'd better not try to kill him, or God would take vengeance on them. Seven times. So that no one finding him would kill him. Why does God do this? It ensures for Cain a real long life here on earth. Is that the win? 
If I live a hundred years, is that the win? No. No matter how long Cain lives, no matter how short Abel's life was, Abel's the winner. Because he learned how to master sin's devices while he was here on earth. Submission to God and God's word. Cain, no matter how long he lived, he never got there. The saddest words in scripture, verse 16, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. God is trying with open arms to receive him in, but Cain just would not have it. We never see him confess his sin. We truly never see him repent of sin. So we find that Cain is the first one when he died to bust hell wide open. Jude chapter 11, all the way back. Jude verse 11. There's, not, there's only one chapter. So Jude verse 11 says, Woe to them. Um, he's talking about people who reject God's authority. Woe to them, for they have gone the way of Cain. Goes in and he lists a bunch of other things, but they've gone the way of Cain. There is a way. There was the way of Abel, and there was the way of Cain. Two ways. The way of Abel is the seed of the woman. The way of Cain was the seed of the serpent. But now what? The seed of the woman is dead. Now there's only one seed. What happens? Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. Not the Enoch that we know about, that we'll learn about in the next chapter. This is another Enoch. Enoch, and he built a city. Remember, God said to be fruitful and multiply and spread out. What do we see Cain doing? Let's get a city together. Let's all gather my people. Now, we can understand why Cain wanted to gather people together. He's been wandering. He has to find food because the ground will not produce for him. He builds a city and called the name of the city after his son. Why would he call the name of... You so said, that's selfless. He named the city, could have named it after himself, but he names it after his son. Why? Because his son can plant in the ground and can get a harvest. So he's dependent on his son. So his son is going to provide for him. Now to Enoch was born... Arad, and Arad became the father of Mahujiel, and Mahujiel became the father of Methushiel, and Methushiel became the father of Lamech. Lamech became the first polygamist. Lamech took to himself two wives. God said, one man, one wife for life. We see Cain rebelling against God, and we see his descendants rebelling in other ways. Sin never remains static. The name of one of his wives was Ada, and the other name was Zilhah. And Ada gave birth to Jabal, and he was the father of those who dwelled in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. Uh, he was the father of those who play in lyre and pipes, so they were musical. And for Zilha, she also gave birth to Tubal Cain, the first forger of all implements of bronze and iron. So there's a talented crowd gathering together. Everything that they need to not have to do what God said. God said, you're going to be a vagrant and a wanderer. And he says, no, I'm not going to be. I'm going to get all my people together in one city, and they'll provide for me. The sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilha, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Does this sound like a one flesh relationship he has with them? Or do we see him 
domineering his wives just as God has said. And we've seen history of it. Give heed to my speech, for I have killed a man for wounding me, and the boy for striking me. Cain was a murderer, and guess what we find in his child? Also, more murder. One murder leads to more murder. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Again, we see the line of Cain trying to get to know God through their own understanding. What's he doing here? He obviously has been taught that his father murdered his uncle and that God protected him so he could not get killed. And so he takes that as, I'm going to go out and kill even more people and then God will give me more protection. Not true, by the way. Then verses 25 uh, and 26 bring hope. Remember we said, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent are at odds with each other. The kingdom, uh, the children of God and the children of Satan. And what do we find? The children of God are murdered. Abel's dead. All there is is the, the children of Satan. But then it says, Adam had relations with his wife again, and she gave birth to a son, and they named him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel. Hope, hope. For Cain killed him. The two seeds. To Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. And then it says this. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Everything up to this point was the Lord seeking men, but now we see Seth's line responding. I want to close Back in 1 John, in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, it's here somewhere, 1 John chapter 2, we read this yesterday I believe, verse 15, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. What do we find with Cain? Cain loves the things of the world more than he loves God. He loves his job more than he loves God. When God has taken away his ability to do that job, he hates God. Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. There's an impasse. For you and for me. You say, well, I love God. I pray to God. Well, do you pray to God to help you keep your job and for you to make more money and for you to be healthy and you would be wealthy and you'd be wise? Comfortable? Ease? What happens if God took all that away? Would you still praise the name of the Lord? Or are you just, am I just serving God because he helps me really serve what I really love, which is myself. Job got tested this way. Even his wife said, hey, you should just curse God and die. Job says, how can I take the good things from God and not take the things that are not seen as good? If the whole purpose is to get to know God, I can get to know him through good things. And I can get to know him through very difficult things. Cain could get to know God by God rejecting his sacrifice. But at some point along the way, he's going to have to confess sin. He's going to have to deal with his pride as I'm going to have to myself and as you are too. Love not, do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Cain chose the things of the world over the things of God. The line of Seth is coming and saying, we're going to value the things of God more. Why is that an important distinction? This next verse will sum it up for us today. The world is passing away and also its lusts. Everything that Cain loved was temporary. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. Cain stands as the first monument to total rebellion throughout his whole life. He was born without God. God visited him and he rejected God and he died without God. He produced children who hated God and became a line of people that Satan could readily use. If you look at the line of family that you're involved in, is it a line of people who are about eternal things, or is it a line of people who are about temporal things? Regardless of the line I come from, I still have to make my own decisions. But if I was born in a line of people who are only about temporal things, it's going to be of the utmost difficulty to break the reinforced tradition of loving stuff, loving temporal things of the world more than loving God. Where are you at in this journey? May God show us where we're at in this whole endeavor of learning how to master sin. Father God, help us to recognize the fact that we cannot master sin in and of ourselves. The only option of mastering sin is to surrender ourselves completely to you. Lay ourselves at your mercy. Accept your grace and submit to your word and your way. Help us to do that today, Father. In Jesus' name we pray.